Hey guys, today I'm going to talk about trading magic cards back in the day. Uh, a lot has changed since then. I'm talking about 19, not 19, 2008, 2006, before the everyone had a cell phone with data plans. Now, trading was very different. There was a lot of trade sharking, which is defined as someone taking advantage of someone else because of a knowledge gap. So if you know a card is worth $15, that person will say, what do you value this at? And maybe the person doesn't know, so they just say $2. Well, he's gonna add it to the trade section. A lot of very bad trading behavior happened during this time period. And very little of it is reported because it's one of those dark periods in magic where, you know, we Wizard of the Coast wants us to believe all magic players are friendly. But in my experience, given the right circumstance, magic players do take advantage of each other to the greatest degree possible. Uh, the best example of trade sharking would be no matter how you dress it up, trading a pack to power, trading a booster pack of standard for a piece of power. Now today we would say, hmm, that seems kind of difficult to do or who would possibly do that? Well, by trading piece by piece and getting value at every level, you can get a, a piece of power, supposedly. So back to the trading stories. I will share a trading story from 2013 at a store called Groovy Geckos in Williamsburg, Virginia. I can talk about the store because it no longer exists. Uh, it has gone bankrupt. And I will say that there is a person, I do know his name, and he would come to the store. He was younger, probably 18, 19. He never played magic at the store. It would come for the sole purpose of trading. And recently, he actually responded to one of my videos, and he's pretty much an ass. And this is your typical trade shark. Uh, he would go to this very casual place. Groovy Get Coach was probably 800 square feet. You had about 20 regulars and then some maybe 20 new players. So a whole player base of 40 people. He would go there, and he would just trade shark everyone. Uh, this was before that people really cared about value. This was during when EDH started getting popular, really popular. So there was still a gap of understanding, a gap of knowledge on certain EDH cards. I remember one trade he did. He traded a person a foil angel, which was maybe worth $20 for a complete playset of Liliana the Veil at the time worth about $25. So it doesn't seem that bad at that time, but it turned out to be very bad. And I do remember him trading a, what was it? He was trading a Scars of Meriden land, a Sea Chrome Coast, which was the most valuable land at the time. It was going for around $20 for multiple fetch lands, uh, multiple foil fetch lands, probably about $120 of foil fetch lands at the time. Again, fetch lands were not that valuable. They just had rotated out in Zendikar at least not as valuable as they are today. And the Sea Chrome Coast was extremely valuable and extremely in demand standard card, but he still got his six to one value. Now trade sharking was quite interesting and I, I definitely wanna make a video from my perspective of it because it is important to document the reality of magic players. Now, many magic YouTubers will show magic players are the best community, they are, you know, they are the friendliest and people give out free cards and that's great. That is fantastic. You know, it's fantastic when people get give out free cards and they post on Reddit that they give, give out free cards and now they have a thousand Reddit posts, right? That's fantastic, good for, good for you. But I know the true reality of magic. I know the true reality of it because I've seen it firsthand and no amount of sugarcoating it can how many people were doing pack to power? The concept of pack to power is to trade shark, take advantage of multiple people, eventually waking, making your way up to a piece of power. That is the end conclusion. I, I love how people say the good stuff about it. Oh, it's about you know helping players. And 
when you go up that much in value, when you go from a bulk rare to a power nine, there has to be some give. There has to be tremendous give. Um, and people did it. Um, I think multiple people did the pack to power. It inspired people to go for value and nickel and dime. Uh, there are many trade stories out there where people were trading fake cards and new players for all their good cards. Um, and the justification is very simple. I met some guy at the local shop who bought nine fat packs looking for a certain card. He got the card he wanted and he took a couple of high value rares and sold me a leftovers for $20. Um, so this is new Phyrexia. Maybe, maybe not good, but everyone's looking for a good deal. So let me put the heart of this darkness is that people want a good deal. People want to go to a flea market. There's many magic channels out there, real or not real. I, I don't know how someone can go to a flea market, a different flea market every weekend, but that's neither here nor there, where the whole concept is I pay $20 and look at this. It's a full place set of fetch lands. I wonder why this person didn't know what the value was. Oh, okay, look at this. Now it's a full set of new Phyrexia for $40, right? Oh, oh man, I bought this and they have a whole play set of a dual lands. I got it for 10 cents, right? That's the point. Like that makes a good YouTube video. When someone buys something at a flea market for 20 bucks and turns out to be 200. People love that and they will eat that up all day. And you know why? It's because there's a little bit of darkness. Someone had to lose value for you to gain value. It is a net zero game. Now, if that person didn't know that the card that they had was a Black Lotus and they sold it for 10 cents, then the justification, and it's a justification made many times, ethical or not, is, oh, the person didn't know, that's fine. Some people will say, oh, I will tell the person that the Black Lotus is worth this much money. Let me explain why that actually never happens in reality. Okay, so a lot of times you you hear about somebody, oh, I found this really great dual land and on Reddit especially to get the likes and I told him what it was worth and I paid him close to what it's worth. That seems kind of far-fetched to me and every single one of those stories ends up on the top post of Reddit for other reasons, you know, for the ego reasons. But assuming that that story is fake, which I think most of those stories are fake, I can tell you why that would never happen. Uh, the reason that no magic player would ever tell another magic player that that is the black or another person, hey, this is the black lotus that you have. As soon as that person looks up the black lotus, what price are they going to go off? Are they going to go off buy buy list? They're going to go off buy it now on eBay, and they're going to want ten thousand dollars for it. There is no way somebody tells you it's a black lotus, and then you go online and you find out you hit the lottery and you want less than the expected value at that point in time. The eBay price, the buy it now price, which is way over the actual buy list price where you can buy for it. So let, let me put this in very clear example. Let's say at a flea market, you found a Black Lotus, it's selling for a dollar because all her cards are selling for a dollar. And you pick up the Black Lotus and you say, hey, do you know this card is worth $5,000? The first thing she's gonna do is she's gonna take off out her cell phone check run it on ebay and find out that it's actually worth ten fifteen thousand dollars and then she'll be like oh i want fifteen thousand dollars for it when someone finds out something is really valuable they overvalue it right and especially given today it's the same with retro video games when you tell someone this retro video game is very expensive they don't want a fair price for it they want ebay buy it now pristine condition grade 10 price because they don't know the difference and that's why these stories never made any sense to me. So these stories always end up this way. Oh, valuable Black Lotus. Oh, I told this grandmother that it was valuable. Oh, and then she sold it to me for $50. Are you telling me she didn't go on eBay and find out that it's selling for 100,000 and take the highest price and say, I want 100,000 for it? Because that's not human nature, right? So all these Feel good stories, in my opinion, are fake. I've done enough trading to know that they're fake. Um, where all these finds, if they are real, they don't play out that way. They don't. They just cannot. 
Um, and you might be like, oh, you're very negative. You're a negative blotch onto the magic community. No, I'm reality. And the reality is if you found a black lotus for $1, you risk not having that black lotus. You risk, you risk everything telling that woman what the black lotus is worth because when you tell her it's worth $10,000, she's actually going to want 100000 for it. How do I know this? Because it happens. I own a store. It happens all the time where the people who are not familiar, the only reason it's a dollar is because he's not familiar with the game. They overvalue their collections. I get these collections that come in and they're decent collections. They're Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! But they want the buy it now eBay price grade 10. They want some ridiculously high price for it. And I have to turn them down. And they asked me why, you know, I went online and they told me it was this much money. I was like, well, there's fees. This is not actually what I sold at. There are, you know, shipping. I, there's time I have to, you know, inventory it. There's time I need to spend um, distributing it. And I don't know how long it's going to sit there. So these stories uh, of these good white knights, I mean... Man, like if you own a store and you're buying stuff, you understand that the majority of people who don't know magic, who bring stuff in to sell to you, is not looking to sell for anything less than eBay buy it now price. They've looked it online and they figured out that's what it's worth and they take it to your store and they say, this is what I want. Magic back in the day with trading was literally just people ripping each other off with no mercy. And I don't make this up. Um, I really do feel like it was a sad time in Magic. We have gotten a lot better because people know Magic cards are worth money. There's so many different ways for them to check and so many different websites that didn't exist back then for them to check on if the trade is fair. But wow, you know, the darkness was just incredible, especially after EDH because a lot of those cards went up in value. A lot of those cards that were worthless went up in value. And then especially the foils, the old foils, a card could be 10 cents one day and then $100 the next. And unless you read articles and then or you had the data plan or, I mean, your data plan wouldn't even work in most convention centers because the signal tower was too weak at the time. So unless you had like a list of things that you knew were very valuable, then, you know, you, you were at risk for trading a $100 card for 10 cents. And I'm totally serious about that. It happened all the time at GPs. I went to one of the GP Richmond's back when I was uh, in law school. And, and this, we had cell phones at this time. We all had cell phones, we all had data plans, but the convention center didn't have like a signal. And people got ripped off way badly because they were uh, fetch lands. The rotation was... Uh, Zendikar. So JST Mind Sculptor, people knew were valuable, but people assumed the Fetch Lands and the foil ones, when the enemy ones, would not be valuable. So they were getting ripped off pretty, uh, pretty badly for that. And that is the darkest timeline of the magic trading. Anyway, bye guys.